The longer that we live, the more that we understand that uh, nothing stays the same in our lives. People change. Situations change. Relationships change. What we are today, we were not yesterday. Some of the photographs that we have from years ago will tell us that, right? Life goes on, time goes on, and there's nothing that we can do to stop it. What is true of us is also true of this world. It is a reality of history that nations rise and that nations fall. They're here today, they're gone tomorrow. But what is also true is this. That sometimes the sin and the pride of a nation is what causes it to fall. Daniel chapter 5 is an illustration of that reality. It is an account of the fall of the nation of Babylon given to us by a man who was there. An eyewitness account by Daniel. But it's also the fulfillment of a dream, or at least part of a dream, right? Daniel chapter 2. It was a dream that King Nebuchadnezzar had. A, a dream that was given to him by God. He dreamed he saw a statue, an overwhelming and overpowering statue. And this statue had a head of gold, and we're told that that head of gold was Nebuchadnezzar. It was the nation of Babylon. It was a picture of him. And though it had a head of gold, its chest and its arms were made of silver. Life goes on, time goes on. And one day the nation of Babylon would fall. And another nation would rise to take its place. In Daniel chapter 5, we are about to witness that event. As this chapter begins, Nebuchadnezzar has been dead for about 23 years. And the nation of Babylon is also dying. It's falling apart. His son succeeded him to the throne, but he didn't last very long. After only two years, the the husband of his sister murdered him, assassinated him. He didn't last very long either. After four years, he died. And his son, who was just a child, who would have become the king, was then murdered. There was no one. No one to to ascend to the throne to take the leadership in Babylon. So one of the men who was part of the conspiracy to murder that child was a man by the name of Nabonidus. And he became the next king of Babylon. But he had no right to the throne. He wasn't a legal heir to the throne. So he married someone who was part of the royal family. We think he married a a daughter of King Nebuchadnezzar. And he adopted her son, who was a man by the name of Belshazzar. But Nabonidus didn't spend too much time in Babylon. So he left his adopted son there to rule. And as time went on, Nabonidus was facing a growing threat from the armies and from the nation of the Medes and the Persians. And so he was out fighting, trying to hold on to the kingdom, so he left his adopted son, Belshazzar, in command to reign in the city of Babylon. And so Nabonidus went out to meet the Medes and the Persians, but he was no match for them. And finally, he was defeated about 50 miles from Babylon, defeated by the Persian king Cyrus. And then Cyrus turned his attention to the city of Babylon. He surrounded the city with his armies. And as Daniel chapter 5 begins... The Medes and the Persians have besieged that city for maybe two, three months without very much success. 
King Nebuchadnezzar had built a wall around the city, a wall that was over 80 feet thick and 350 feet high. That's quite a wall. The city had accumulated so much food and so many provisions that they could last for years. The river Euphrates ran under the wall of the city and it ran through the city. They had an endless supply of water. We're told that the Babylonian soldiers would get up on the walls of the city and they would yell down to the Persian army and tell them to go home because there was no way that they would be able to take and capture the city. Babylonians felt very secure. And so while this enemy is outside of the city, we're told in verse 1 of Daniel chapter 5, Belshazzar, the king, was inside the city and he held a great feast. He brought together men, leading men of the city, and he threw a party. He threw a party for a thousand of his nobles and his captains and his lords the military, and the political leaders. But it was more than just a banquet. It was an orgy where every sin imaginable was exalted as part of the worship of their pagan gods. So even though Babylon was a magnificent city, and even though it was a city that was fortified, impressive, It was also a city of of wickedness, a city of the occult, a city of satanic worship. Ever since the days of the Tower of Babel, when men built that tower in order to exalt themselves above God, ever since then that city had been a city that was in rebellion against the God of heaven. In fact, all false religions come from that city. That's their birthplace. God had allowed this nation to rise to a place of power, to a place of prominence. But he did that in order to accomplish his plan and his purpose, and now he is about to bring his judgment on this city that has so wickedly disobeyed and dishonored him. And so it says in verse 1, the king. The king was drinking wine in front of the presence of the thousand. They were there, he says, and he tasted the wine. It was a night of drinking. And so he gave orders to his officials to bring forth those gold and silver vessels which King Nebuchadnezzar, his father, Ab in, in Aramaic, his descendants, probably his grandfather, bring those vessels that he had taken from the temple in Jerusalem. We read about that, right? Daniel chapter 1. Nebuchadnezzar brought those vessels from the city of Jerusalem and it said he placed them in the temple of his God and that is where they remained for 70 years. The sacred vessels that Solomon, King Solomon, had placed in the temple that God had told him to build, those vessels had been removed and placed in the temple of a heathen, of a pagan god. So the king knew where to find them. Not only did he know where to find them, he know he knew who they belonged to. Not only did he believe that the enemy outside of the city had no power over him, couldn't harm him, he believed that the God of heaven had no power over him and couldn't harm him either. And so, in the pride of his heart, he chose to insult God. And so he brought those vessels, those sacred vessels, into this disgraceful scene of wickedness. And it says there in verse 2, the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines, drank. 
They drank from those vessels. They drank from them so that they could mock the God of heaven. And so they brought them in. They brought in the vessels from the house of God in Jerusalem, and that's what they did. They drank from them, and they not only did they drink from them, it says this in verse 4, they praised Shavak. They gave honor and glory and majesty and reverence to their gods of silver and gold and bronze and iron and wood and stone. They exalted their gods above the God of heaven. Idols, it says in Psalm 135. The work of man's hands. They have mouths, the psalmist says, but they don't. They don't, they don't speak, they don't see, they don't hear. They have ears, but they can't hear, they're just wood and stone. He said they have no breath. And the psalmist says those who make them will be like them. Yes, everyone who trusts in them. And so the king is like those idols, he is blind. He has no spiritual insight. He's dead in his sin. He's without life. And so as these nobles and as these women and as the king is there drinking and praising their gods and blaspheming and slandering the God of heaven, verse 5 says this, Suddenly, Shah. In Aramaic. From out of nowhere. Without any warning. All of a sudden. The fingers of a man's hand emerged. Where did they come from? They come out of the wall? Doesn't say. But one minute they weren't there. And then the next minute. In in the blink of an eye. They were. And those fingers, it says, began writing. They began writing opposite the lampstand, near the wall, the place where the light was the best. That was usually where the most important person in that room was. Who do you think that was? The king. So these fingers begin writing, it says, on the plaster of the wall, in the king's palace. Well, that must have shocked everyone. Certainly unexpected. Jeremiah chapter 25 says this, God will punish the nation of Babylon. He will punish them for their iniquity and he will cause them to drink from the cup of his wrath. And so the king, the nation, have refused to listen to God. They they defy God. Even though they knew the example of King Nebuchadnezzar, they knew the story, they knew what happened to him. But instead, they ignore him. They ignore God. They ignore the power of God over the life of that king. Literally, the handwriting's on the wall. So they're about to drink from the cup of the wrath of God. No more opportunity to repent. The, that opportunity is gone. They've passed the point of no return. There is a point of no return. They have passed that point. The sin of this nation has caused them to fall. There's no turning back now for them. That is a sobering thought. That is a frightening thought. That there comes a point for a nation where there's no turning back and all that remains is judgment. And so it says in verse 5 that the king saw the back of the hand of the fingers that were writing. And then as suddenly as they had appeared, they were gone. And it says in verse 6, the king's face, ziv, the, uh, the brightness of the color of his face. 
turned, and it says it became shina. It became pale. He lost the color in his face. It looked like he was going to be sick. And so he began to think. It said he his thoughts were going through his mind, and these thoughts alarmed him. Behal, he was terrified by what he was thinking, and his hip joints became slack. He couldn't stand on his feet. His knees began knocking together. He was trembling with fear. What was he thinking? Perhaps he was thinking this was the finger of God. Everything stopped. There was no more music. There was no more dancing. There was no more singing. There was no more drinking. There was no more sinning. Everything stopped. Party's over. And then the king, it says in verse 7, called Quara. He screamed. He cried out. Bring in the conjurers. The astrologers, bring in the Chaldeans, the scholars, the experts, bring in the diviners, the soothsayers, bring in all the men who claim to have insight and wisdom and knowledge into divine things. Sounds like his grandfather, doesn't it? His grandfather did that twice, chapter 2 and chapter 4, and we know how that ended up. And so the king spoke, verse 7, and and he said to the wise men, If any of you can read this inscription that is has been supernaturally etched into this wall, and if any man can explain its interpretation to me, well, that man will be clothed in purple. He will receive a royal robe. And everyone will bow before him, and he will receive a chain of gold. It will be a sign of the great honor and respect he will have in this kingdom. Not only that, he'll become the third ruler. Why the third? Well, Nabonidus was first. Belshazzar was second. The king offered the best that he could. He said, I'll make you number three in the kingdom. But what he didn't know that uh, being third in a kingdom that only has a few hours left to exist is not much of a reward, not much of an incentive. So verse 8, it says the wise men came in. They stood before the king, but they couldn't read the inscription. Why, why couldn't they read it? It's written in Aramaic. We don't know why they couldn't read it. But it said they couldn't, they couldn't give the king the interpretation of it. That part we, we understand, right? Their record for success in these things has not been good for the last 70 years. And so, now what is the king to do? They didn't know the answer. Maybe that's what he was thinking. Where do I go? How do I understand what's been written on the wall? And so it says in verse 9 that he became greatly alarmed, even more terrified than he was before, and his face grew paler. And his nobles, his dinner guests, verse 9, says they were perplexed. Perplexed. Shibash. It means to be tangled up. They were running around in confusion. There was pandemonium. There was chaos in the banquet hall. So then comes the voice of reason. Verse 10. The queen, the queen mother. Remember, the king's wives were already at the banquet. So this is his mother. The daughter of King Nebuchadnezzar. She entered the banquet hall because of of the words of the king and the nobles. Because of all of the excitement. Things were out of control. So here comes mom to try to calm things down. 
She might not have been so willing to uh, point out to the king how he could get the answer if she really knew what the words on that wall meant. But she spoke and she said this, verse 10. O king, live forever. Well, she's not off to a great start. He only actually has a few more hours to live. And she says, son, don't let your your thoughts alarm you. Don't be afraid. And, and don't look so pale with anguish, the anguish that, that you have over this unusual event. She said, O king, there, there is a man in your kingdom, a man in whom is the, the spirit, is the breath of the holy gods, of the holy God. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Isn't that what King Nebuchadnezzar said when he described Daniel in chapter 4? And so she said, in the days of your father, your grandfather, illumination and light and understanding and insight and discernment and wisdom, skill in applying knowledge, all of this was found in this man. His wisdom, she said, was like the wisdom of the gods. It was wisdom that came from above. It wasn't earthly wisdom. All of these things were found in him. And so King Nebuchadnezzar, your your grandfather, yes, your grandfather the king, he recognized this. He saw this in this man. And so he did this, verse 11. He appointed him and raised him up to be in a position as the chief, as the master of the magicians and the conjurers and the Chaldeans and the diviners. He was in charge of them. And he's, the queen mother said, this is because he had an extraordinary spirit, an ability that rested on him and in him. He had knowledge. He had insight. He had insight into the interpretation of dreams. He could explain enigmas, dark sayings, perplexing questions, and he was able to solve difficult problems. All of these things were found in this man who was called Daniel, whom the king, your your grandfather, named Belteshazzar. So, O king, my son, it would make sense to call for Daniel. Let Daniel be summoned, and he will make known and declare the interpretation of this, of this difficult situation. Well, now Daniel's a man In his 80s. And so Daniel is called out of retirement. And he's brought in. Brought in before the king. And the king spoke to him and he asked him. And he said this in verse uh, 13. Are you the that Daniel, one of the exiles from Judah, whom my my grandfather, the king, brought from Judah 70 years ago? Are, Are you the same one? I've heard that a spirit of the gods is in you. And that illumination and light and insight and extraordinary wisdom have been found in you. I hear there's nobody quite like you, Daniel. And so, here's the situation we've got. He says, just now, verse 15, not more than a few minutes before you came in, the wise men and the, and the conjurers were brought before me. They were brought in so that they might read the inscription. So that they might make its interpretation known to me, but they, they could not declare it. They could not interpret this message. But I have personally heard about you. I know about you, and I have heard that you are able to give interpretations of visions and of dreams, and that you're able to solve difficult problems. And Daniel, that's what we have here. We've got a difficult problem. 
So, if you're able, if you're able to read the inscription and to make its interpretation known, here is what I will do for you. I will clothe you in purple. I will put a, a gold necklace around your neck. And I will give you authority as the third ruler in the kingdom of Babylon. Verse 17, then Daniel answered. And he said this before the king. Keep your gifts. Or give your rewards to someone else. However, I will read the inscription to the king and I will make its interpretation known to him. Verse 18. Here is what he says. He says, O king, the Most High God, the God of Israel, the God whom I serve, he has granted Yahab in Aramaic. He has, has given your grandfather sovereignty. He gave him power. He gave him the ability. He allowed him to rule and to reign with absolute authority in his kingdom. It is the Most High God, O King, who gave him grandeur, who filled him and allowed him to flourish with abundance and with success in his kingdom for his entire reign. He gave him glory. People valued him. They valued him because he was a a gifted leader. So men raised him up. They exalted him. They gave him honor. And God gave him majesty. He was respected by everyone. All of this was given to King Nebuchadnezzar, your grandfather. But remember, O king, this was given to him by God. And because of this grandeur, this, this exceeding greatness, which God bestowed upon him, he says all the peoples of the earth, all the nations, everyone of every tongue and language and tribe, everyone feared him. They were in awe of him. They were terrified of him. Whoever he wished, he killed Whoever he wished, he he allowed to live. He spared them alive. He held the power of life and death over all of his subjects. He said, whomever he chose, he would elevate, he would exalt, and whomever he wished, he would humble. His word was law. No one questioned him. But, Daniel says in verse 20, When his heart and his mind rebelled against God and he was lifted up and elevated in his thinking so that he exalted himself above God and in his spirit, in his life, he became so proud and so full of himself that he behaved arrogantly without any thought of who God is. Only who he was. He forgot that it is the God of heaven who gave him his power and his might. And when that happened, Daniel says in verse 20, God deposed him. Neketh. He brought him down to the pit. He removed him from his royal throne and his glory and his majesty, and his dominion, and his kingdom, Daniel says, was all taken away from him. You know this story, O king. You know the story of your grandfather. It's well documented. In fact, there are probably people in this room who witnessed it happen. It wasn't that long ago. Ask your mother. You know how he was driven away from mankind. You saw how his heart was made like the beasts. You knew that his dwelling place 
was with the wild donkeys. He was given grass to eat like cattle. He lived outside. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven. And you know that he remained that way for seven years until he recognized and understood and learned that it is the God of heaven, the Most High God, who is the ruler over the realm of mankind, not him. And it is he, it is God who sets over it whomever he chooses. You know his testimony, O king. You know how his life was changed. You know how God changed his heart. He says, yet, verse 22, yet you, his, his grandson, Belshazzar, you have not humbled your heart, even though you knew all of this. You're not ignorant of what happened to him. But none of this has affected you. None of this has caused you to change. You haven't learned anything from the life of your grandfather. But instead, he says, verse 23, you have exalted yourself against the God of heaven. You've moved in the wrong direction without any consequences of what it would bring on you. And so you commanded your officials and they brought the vessels of the house, of his house, the house of God, And you brought them before you and your nobles and your wives and your concubines. And then you drank from them, but you didn't even consider. You didn't even consider how God had dealt with your grandfather. You never thought that he would deal with you in that way. You have acted in rebellion. A rebellion against what you knew. How you knew God would deal with that kind of disobedience and sin. And then you went even further. He says in verse 23, you praised the gods of silver and gold and of bronze and iron and wood and stone, which do not hear, which do not see. They don't understand. Not only did you reject God, But you placed these idols above God. You placed God below them. The very God, he says in verse 23, in whose hand is your life breath, is your next breath, and your paths, your ways, the path your life will follow. It's in his hand. But him, you have not glorified. Instead, you've chosen to reject him. You've chosen to reject God and to worship idols. And like your grandfather, you challenge the God of heaven to stop you. You know what happened to your grandfather, right? But still, you did it anyway. So then, Verse 24, Daniel says, that God sent the hand that you saw, and it was sent from him, O king. It was sent from God, and the inscription that was written out is a message. It's a message from God to you. Now, this is the inscription. This is the inscription that was written out first, he says, verse 25. There are the words, mene, mene. Words repeated twice. Means to, to count out. Or to number, as you would, you would count out money. That's the first. The second, he says, verse 25. Tekel. Like the Hebrew word, shekel, a coin. He says that word means to weigh out. Like you would weigh something out on a scale to determine its value, its true value. Finally, Daniel says, the third, verse 25, euphorsim. 
Well, that word uh, means half a shekel. To divide. To divide in half. Well, that's what it says. Okay. Now, here is what it means. Here's the interpretation of the message. And pay attention, O king, because it applies to you. Bene. God has numbered your kingdom. He has counted out your days right down to the end of your days, and he is about to put an end to it. He's about to end your life, and he's about to end your kingdom. Shall I go on? Verse 27, Daniel says, Tekel, you have been weighed by God, weighed on his scales, and you have been found deficient. You have been found to be too light. You have no substance. You have no integrity. You have no spiritual value or worth. Third, Paris, the singular form of the word euphorsen. Your kingdom has been divided. It's been broken in two. In fact, it's already been done. Daniel says, it has been given over to the Medes and the Persians. And so, numbered, numbered, counted out and found to be too light, of no value, and so divided and broken into pieces. That's the message to the king. So then Belshazzar gave orders, and they clothed Daniel in purple, and they put a necklace of gold around his neck, and they he issued a proclamation that he should now be, have authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. But while all of this is going on, while this feast is going on, the king and his soldiers didn't know that the Medes and the Persians were outside and they have been digging a trench in order to divert the river Euphrates, to divert it into a lake, a swamp. And now the river is low enough for them to wade through the water and get into the city. So while the people partied, they are making their way through the city of Babylon. Now the party's really over. Verse 30, it says, That same night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was slain, killed. And so Darius the Mede received the kingdom at the age of 62. How many people, how many nations continue to defy God like Belshazzar? Continue to refuse to humble themselves before him until it's too late. Until there's no way back. Until the hour of judgment has come upon uh, upon them. The message of this chapter is pretty clear, isn't it? There will come a time, a moment in time, when it will be too late. It's too late for Belshazzar. It's not too late for us. It's not too late for you. It's not too late for me. It's not too late. If we come to Christ, then we will have eternal life. Life forever with Him. And it's not too late to change the direction of our lives if we will humble ourselves before God. That is the message for us. Our pride doesn't have to take us down to the pit. Our pride doesn't have to take us to the place where we fall. Like the nation of Babylon. That's the writing on the wall. The question becomes, will we read it? Are we willing to read it? And that is the message for all of us here today.
You've been listening to Bruce David Bell, pastor of Berean Bible Fellowship. If the Lord has ministered to you through this message and you would like more information, then visit us on the web at bbfva.org.